So please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4 with me this morning. Mark chapter 4. We are going to read verses 35 to 41 this morning. Please read along with me. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the preaching of his word to our hearts and to our souls this morning. In the classic French novel and also award-winning Broadway play, Les Miserables, Victor Hugo tells the story of a man named Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean was a man who stole a loaf of bread in order to provide for his hungry family and as a consequence spent years doing forced labor in the galleys of Toulon. During those years of forced labor, Jean Valjean grew incredibly strong and demonstrated remarkable feats of strength. It was very clear to everyone around him that he had strength beyond the normal man. Later in the story, through a variety of circumstances, Jean Valjean escapes from his sentence, and then he creates a new life with with a new name. And he so prospers in that new life that he actually becomes the mayor of a small town. He's loved by by everybody that knows him, and almost no one has any idea of the life that he once lived in the galleys of Toulon. That is, except for a man named Javert. Javert is a cruel and graceless man, set on executing his perception of justice wherever he can. Javert had spent years as an officer in the galleys of Toulon and had witnessed Jean Valjean's immense strength firsthand. And when the officer Javert first meets Jean Valjean, who is now a wealthy mayor of a small town, respected by all that know him, Javert immediately thinks that he recognizes the mayor from somewhere, but he he can't be sure. But over time, he indeed begins to suspect that he does know this man, and he even begins to suspect that he knows him from his time in the galleys of Toulon, but he's unable to prove it. That is until one day when the mayor's strength gives him away. It happened one afternoon that a local man was driving his horse and cart when the horse stumbled, broke two of its legs, and then the cart flipped over, pinning the man underneath. And while everyone in the town was was standing around wondering what to do, waiting for somebody to go get a jack to to lift the car up, Jean Valjean, the mayor, comes and he knew knew, this this man's going to die if we don't do something. Something needs to be done. Help me lift this car. But the crowd didn't want to help. And sadly, standing in the crowd was Javert. And Javert approached Jean Valjean and looked directly at him and intentionally and maliciously tells him that the only person he had ever known who might have the power to lift that cart was a man that he knew in the galleys of Toulon. Immediately, Jean Valjean knows that he is about to be discovered. But that doesn't stop him. 
Immediately, Jean Valjean climbs under the cart, and then with, with immense strength, he begins to push the cart off of the man. No one there had ever seen strength like this before. No one except for Javert. Jean Valjean's strength displayed his identity. There was ultimately, in this moment, no mistaking who he was when his strength, when his power was put on display. His power revealed his true person. And folks, this is what we have in our text this morning in front of us. Our text, in this text, we have Jesus' power on display in unmistakable ways. This is the first miracle in Mark's gospel account that deals with Jesus' power over the natural world. Everything up to this point in the gospel of Mark has been smaller, more, more personal demonstrations of, of power. But here, Jesus takes on the power of the cosmos itself. And listen, this is very intentional. Mark is a, Mark is a brilliant storyteller. And he intentionally inserts stories about Jesus in, in specific ways and in a specific order in order to make significant theological statements about Jesus. And so if you look back at the end of chapter 3 through to this point in chapter 4, Jesus has made some really significant claims about his power. If you look at the end of chapter 3, you see Jesus claiming to be the binder of the strong man, saying that he has bound Satan himself and is now plundering this world, bringing, bringing men and women back to himself and to the Father. And then in the first part of, of chapter 4, we see the parable of the mustard seed. And we see that, that though the kingdom of God grows with unassuming progress, it will go on to have unimaginable impact. Its power and strength will be unmatched. So, so Jesus, up until this point, has been telling us about his, his power. But now, from this point in Mark 4 all the way into Mark 8, when we have the clearest declaration of Jesus' identity, Mark shows us that Jesus doesn't just tell us about his power. No, he begins to demonstrate his power in even greater ways. Sinclair Ferguson says this. He says, the series of parables Jesus had told described the principles and power of the kingdom of God. In the section which Mark now introduces, he shows us how that power was manifested in real life situation in the ministry of Jesus. And so what we have here is Mark trying to convince us of Jesus' ultimate identity as the Son of God, and he does that by citing great things that Jesus has done. And we know this from our own lives, right? We, we support arguments, claims that we make by citing things that have happened in the same way that we would make an argument for which is the greatest sports team of all time. Or in the same way that we would make an argument for, for who is the, the greatest second string quarterback of all time, Nick Foles, <laughs> we make those arguments by citing great things that they have done. The Philly special, right? Case closed. It's over. In the same way, Mark highlights areas of Jesus' ministry and life that reveal his true identity, the support, the claim that he is making. That's the purpose of the text in front of us. We are to see God's power on display in this man, Jesus. But listen, church, this is not just so that we can talk about Jesus' power. This is not just for the wow factor of the story. No, Mark wants us to see the power of Jesus so that we can receive comfort and hope from that power. His power is supposed to minister to you this morning. God wants to minister to you through this story about Jesus' power. 
Specifically, the main idea of the text in front of us is, is simply this. This is just the, the, the main summarizing statement. Trusting who Jesus is gives strength in every storm. Trusting who Jesus is gives strength in every storm. Let's just look at three points to help us understand this main point. Point number one, the chaos of the storm. Point number two, the command to be still. And point number three, the comfort of his strength. Let's look at the first, the chaos of the storm. Look at verses 35 to 37 with me. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. What we have in this account is very interesting. First of all, it's interesting because of the, the details that are given in the story. You know, as you read this account from Mark, there, there seem to be a lot of what, what, what would seem to be needless details included here. He tells us about the time of day. He tells us that, that the disciples took Jesus with them, that they, they took him just as he was. He tells us that, that there are other boats that go with him. He tells us that he's asleep in the boat, but not just that, but asleep on a cushion. It's good to notice small details like this in God's Word. I love how when we read God's word, it's not written like so many other ancient epic stories that are told, where they only tell the high points of the story. Why? Because that's what makes for really good storytelling. I love how, how scripture includes seemingly needless details like this. Why? Because it speaks to the fact that these things really happened. These details tell us that this is an eyewitness account likely coming from Peter through Mark. You know, a lot of people in our day would, would like to say that Scripture, your Bible, was only written, in a sense, as first century propaganda, that, that, that authors created these fantastical stories for the sake of, of gaining their own power and, and political advantage. But, but that's actually the exact opposite of why the Scriptures were written. These are real life situations, real life facts captured and written down, not because they advance some political agenda, but because they really happened. And the authors being led by the Holy Spirit want to record every detail that they can of Jesus's life so that we can benefit from it. I think that's amazing. I think that little details like this speak to the, to the authenticity, the, the truthfulness of the Bibles that you hold in your hand right now. Minimally, the inclusion of these details speak to this as an eyewitness account. Folks, this really happened. They really were crossing the Sea of Galilee. There really was a storm that, that arose. And what a storm it must have been. You likely know this, but the Sea of Galilee was and is known for its incredibly violent storms. And that's because the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. And so the, the cool air coming off the mountains, meeting the warm air of the sea, is known just to create very violent storms in a moment's notice. And that seems to be what's happened here. It's just sprung up, this storm. And we know that it is a particularly severe storm by how it's described. Mark says it's a great storm. And we know by how, how quickly it says the boat was already filling up. And we know that it's a severe storm by the disciples' response. They're terrified out of their minds. But now listen, at least four, if not more, of these disciples are experienced fishermen. They have spent their entire lives on the water, often fishing at night. But, but here, they are terrified out of their minds and confident that they are about to perish. They're about to die. I don't know if you have ever been near the point of drowning before. 
but you don't need to have been in that place to get a little bit of what the disciples are experiencing in this moment. Just think back to the last time you went to the beach, right? And you walked into the water and suddenly that, that unexpectedly big wave comes along and knocks you over. So, suddenly you're somersaulting through the water trying to, to catch your breath. The wave is immensely powerful. You don't even need to think of, of the beach. Just think about the, the last theme park you went to with those wave pools. Have you seen those? It's incredibly entertaining to watch grown adults try to keep their balance in those wave pools as water pushes back and forth. Have you ever seen one of those wave pools that are used to help train people how to surf? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like an avalanche of water coming down, and then they give you a surfboard and say, good luck. And so you get these grown guys trying to stand on these surfboards, and suddenly they're just being beaten under the water, trying desperately to hold on to their swimming trunks. It's really amusing. Few things communicate the power of nature and our weakness in nature as much as waves of water and storms on the sea. But listen, you don't even need to be caught in the storm on the Sea of Galilee or even stand in a wave pool to understand the sense of helplessness the disciples feel in this moment. The waves of the ocean are a fitting way to describe much that we experience every day of our lives. Waves are unmanageable. They can't be controlled. They're reckless. And so much of our life is as well. 2 Samuel 22 verse 5, The waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. Listen, biblically speaking, from the Old Testament all the way through the New, the, the sea itself is always used as a way of describing a place of chaos and, and disorder. And church, that is so often a description of your life and my life, isn't it? So friends, where are the storms in your life this morning? In what area of life do you feel like you're drowning? In what area of life are you, like the disciples, terrified about what is going to happen next? You know, another thing that I love about the Bible is that it does not lie to us about the storms in life. Not once in your Bible will you find the promise that if you become a Christian, you're going to go on to have an easy and quiet life. No, if you're looking for that promise in God's word, you're going to be frustrated and disappointed because it's simply not there. The Bible is actually filled with promises that, that our lives are going to be the exact opposite of that. That our lives are going to be battered by, by storm after storm, by wave after wave from every side. The scriptures actually tell us to, to expect this. And so, what are the storms in your life right now? Where do you feel that the chaos of the storm is about to swallow you whole? Friend, don't, don't be surprised by that. Don't be surprised by those things. It's a normal part of living life in this fallen world. But listen, wherever that storm is, no, notice this with me. Notice that not only is Jesus not surprised or concerned about the storm, demonstrated by the crazy fact that he is sound asleep in the boat. Notice this with me. He's in the storm with the disciples. He's in the storm with you this morning. You are not alone. And you are, notice, notice this with me as well. Not only is he not concerned, not only is he in the storm with the disciples, Jesus has actually led them into the storm. Verse 35, look at it. It says, let us, this is Jesus speaking, let us go across to the other side. Covenant, we may not like the sound of it, but, but sometimes our God leads us into the storm. Sometimes those waves that feel like they are going to crush us are his idea. And that's not to, to punish us. That's not to ruin us, but to refine us. It's not to harm us, but to help us. 
like the disciples, Jesus takes us into the storm because he has lessons that he wants to teach us. And learning those lessons are absolutely foundational to growing strong and happy in him together. There's hope in the storm because Jesus is Lord over the storm. That brings us to our second point, which is this, the command to be still. The command to be still. See, if, if Scripture tells us to expect storms in this life, which it does, it also tells us who is Lord over the storm. Yes, there are storms, but in Jesus and in the gospel, there is hope for the storms. In the midst of this incredible storm that they are stuck in, with, with wave coming from this side and wave coming from that side, with the boat sinking lower and lower in the water every second, what is Jesus doing? What's he doing? He's, he's sleeping in the boat. He's sleeping. First of all, what a picture of his humanity. The Son of of God in flesh is so tired from his work and from his labors that he needs to take a nap. He needs to close his eyes. But this, the disciples just can't believe it. The disciples are desperate. They think that they are going to die and they, they need, they want Jesus to do something in this moment. Notice what it says in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So not only are they wondering why he isn't doing something, they are doubting whether he even cares for them anymore or not. Oh, there's application for us there as well, isn't there? Don't we do that all the time? In the midst of the storm, we take our eyes of, off of his great love and we begin to question his goodness. God, are you in this storm? God, how come you don't care about me anymore? I thought we were tight. God, why, how come you've left me here? How come you're not changing my circumstances? Don't you care? But look at what happens next. And I love the simplicity with which Mark shares it with us. Verse 39, and he, Jesus, awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and, and there was a great calm. What was a moment before described as a great storm, now a second later is immediately described as a great calm, all from a simple command from Jesus. Church, can we agree that this is unimaginable power on display? It's unimaginable. We can't even comprehend what is happening in this moment. But listen, you and I love to feel like we are in control of life, don't we? We love, we love to feel like we're able to manage life, like everything that's going on, we're, we, we've got it. We can, we can figure it out. Can we just acknowledge together that, that we're not in control, that we have no power? Do you want a little glimpse of how, if you want a little glimpse of how little power I have, all you need to do is co to come into my home and observe me relate to our new puppy named Lucy. First of all, I thought I had a leadership gift and that we weren't going to get a puppy, but we have a puppy, so there's, there's weakness in that as well. But we get this puppy for Christmas, little Lucy, you know how much she weighs? Three pounds. Four months later, she's four pounds. She is so small. I can hold her out like this without even thinking about it. We took her outside, and, and the wind blew, and it just knocked her over. Just boom. <laughs> she's so small. But do you want to know how much control I have over her? None at all. And I didn't know this. Somebody should have told me this. That dogs, when you first get them, they cry and bark at night like a little baby. Listen, I have four kids. I do not need to return to the baby years, okay? And so we get this dog, and it's the week after Christmas. We're on vacation. I'm trying to rest all night long, and I tried everything. I tried the peace be still. It didn't work. It's helpless. Church, we are so weak. 
we can control so little in this world. But friends, here we see unimaginable power on display. And this is what Mark wants us to see more than anything else. Even as Jesus speaks about how Satan is being bound through his coming and about how the kingdom is going to grow with unassuming progress, even as he says all of that, here he shows us where all of that power is coming from. It's coming from himself, from Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom's power and strength. Jesus is your power and strength this morning. And his power is so strong that he controls the wind and the sea with a word. Notice this. He doesn't control the wind and the sea by praying to God like Jonah did in the Old Testament. There are a lot of similarities between those two stories here, but that's not how he calms the storm. He doesn't recite some incantation to the sea gods. No, this one, this Jesus, controls the winds and the sea because he is God himself, and he controls all things by the word of his power, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Friends, Mark is caring for us here. God is caring for us here. God is caring for us through this story. He is helping us in our many, many fears. He's helping us as we wrestle for peace this morning to put our trust in Jesus who has strength for every storm. Now, as you study the gospel of Mark, which I encourage you to do, it is rich for your soul. One of the things that needs to always be kept in mind, as it does for any New Testament letter, is the the context that it is being written to. And so, so Mark, his audience, his primary audience is the new Christian church in Rome. In Rome. These people were suffering in horrific ways. They were being persecuted on every side. Their lives were in constant danger. Their their world had been tossed totally upside down by the waves and trials and pain that came with simply professing faith in Jesus. They are tempted to fear, listen, like us, like the disciples, they're, they're terrified about what's going to happen next. Oh, the storms of this life are so real. And they are so terrifying, aren't they? But to those that know the Lord over the storm, peace is available through the storm. And so again, what is the storm for you this morning? Maybe it's finances. Maybe you have dug a a financial hole for yourself and for your family that you are fearful you'll never be able to get out of. Maybe it is fear about your own thoughts and your own emotions lately. Maybe in recent days you have been so stuck in your head that the thoughts you've been having really scare you and they are, are dark. Maybe, maybe it's the storm of politics and you're terrified about what this next presidential election will be. Maybe it's the storm of your marriage and how utterly helpless you feel right now in your marriage. Whatever it is, do you know what Jesus says to you in that storm? He says, peace, be still. Peace, be still. You don't need to fear Yes, the storm is real. Yes, the chaos is real. Jesus doesn't ever pretend that it's not, but he still says this. He says, peace be still to you this morning. Why? Because he knows that he is perfectly in control of that storm. And listen, because there has never been a single drop of sorrow that has touched your life that he did not know about and have plans to use for your good and for his glory. Not a drop. The command to be still is a glorious picture of Jesus' sovereign control over our lives and over our circumstances. Notice again with me the great calm that comes over the sea. Church, that same great calm 
is available to you this morning as you put your trust in Jesus. That brings us to our third and final point, the comfort of his strength. As if we haven't seen enough goodness in this passage already, guess what, there's more. Verse 40, Jesus acknowledges how how fearful the disciples were in the storm. They truly thought that they were going to die. It was a a fearful thing. But now, now look at verse 41. After Jesus calms the storm that they were so fearful of a moment before, what does verse 41 say? It says that they were filled with great fear and that they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Isn't that interesting? They were fearful of the storm, but now they are filled with great fear. And what are they fearful of? They're fearful of Jesus. And it's appropriate that they are. The storm was unmanageable in its power, and that is a fearful thing. But suddenly they see that this man standing with them in the boat is even more unmanageable, less able to be controlled than the storm itself. Yeah, the storm's a fearful thing, but how much more should we fear the one who is able to calm the storm? In this moment, the disciples' understanding is just beginning to dawn. They're beginning to see with with greater clarity that that this is not just a good teacher. This isn't even really just a good prophet from God. No, this person has the very authority and power of God within himself. Jesus' power, like Jean Valjean's strength, is revealing his true identity. One commentator says this, he says, here is divine power writ large. Here is divine power writ large. And friends, divine power is a scary business. It is. This is why so many people resist the very idea of God. This is why people have yet to bow their knee to King Jesus because the idea of a God that controls all things is truly scary because it means that he has the power and authority to control their lives and that makes them really uncomfortable. If that's you this morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're not yet a Christian, not yet a disciple of Jesus, Maybe at least in part because you are fearful about what it would mean for your life to submit your life to this all-powerful one. Listen, if that's you, I want you to know, like, that makes sense to me. That makes a lot of sense to me, particularly if all you know about Jesus, all you've heard about Jesus is that he is powerful. Power alone is a fearful thing. And I would be scared if all I knew about Jesus was that he was really strong and that he wanted to have control of my life. That's highly uncomfortable. But friends, the amazing thing about this passage, this story, is that it demonstrates more than just the fact that Jesus is all-powerful. It also demonstrates the fact that he is good and that he is loving. He desires to calm the storms in your life. He wants to minister peace to your heart. He wants to do that in all of life, in all of circumstances. But friends, even more than those areas, this story shows us how Jesus wants to calm the ultimate storm of our lives. In this story, we have divine power writ large. He is truly the Son of God in the flesh, but we also have his humanity writ large. Jesus was asleep in the, in the boat. He was tired. He was worn down. He needed to rest. What a contrast between those two. So with us in our humanity that he needs a nap, yet so apart from us, so different from us in his divinity that he is able to calm the storm with a word. Those two sides of Jesus almost seem incompatible. But friends, they are at the very center of the gospel that we celebrate. They're at the very center of our faith that we rejoice in. Yes, he has the divine authority and power of God himself. He is God himself. 
but he so wants to be in relationship with us. He so wants to minister to you. He so wants to care for you that he was willing to become like you in every respect. And so we ask the question with the disciples, who then is this? And the answer comes, this is the perfect God-man. The only one who can both stand on our behalf and satisfy the demands of God's justice for our sins. And there's a moment coming in the Gospel of Mark when we will see both his humanity and his divinity writ large again. That moment when he hangs physically on a cross, body broken, pain shooting through every limb, even while in his divinity he bears the sins of the entire world. Being our sin bearer, being our substitute, doing what no other man could ever do but doing what he wanted to do because of his great love for you this morning. Friend, if you've never come to Jesus, do not let the fear of his power stop you. Do not let the fear of what it would be to submit your life to him stop you from coming because not only is he able to command the wind and the waves, but he's also to hold you perfectly, perfectly secure in his love. And Christian this morning, Covenant Fellowship this morning, may we find comfort in his strength as well. The one that saved you, the one that loves you with an everlasting love is the one that controls this world by the word of his power. And so may we rest in him this morning with all that we have and rejoice in his great strength. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this text in which we see your divine power writ large. But we thank you that that divine power is not divorced from your humanity. We thank you that in Jesus we have the God-man who has come for our sakes to do what we could not do. And so we pray that your spirit would allow these glorious gospel truths, your word which is living and active, to comfort our hearts, to strengthen us, to encourage us so that we might live boldly for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.